Hi, I'm Kaden Chang, founder of Value Investing Academy. You're tuning in to the Soul Rich Woman Show with Janisha Alora. A strong and independent woman is something to behold. She pays her own bills, buys her own things, and she doesn't let a man affect her stability or self-confidence. She is a soul rich woman. Are you ready to be rich doing what you love? Be on purpose and in control of your life again. At For Women Who Love the F Word podcast, we will be openly talking about getting more clients online, getting recognition as the leader and female entrepreneur, and also the F Word, being fabulous, having freedom, and financial independence. It's time to own and love the F Word. Welcome to the show. Hello and welcome to Soul Rich Woman TV for women who love the F word, being fabulous, having freedom, financial independence, and above all, family. My name is Janisha Alora. Today on this very special interview, we have a really amazing guest with us. Of course, he is going to talk about how he made his dream sustainable Okay, with the founder of Value Investing Academy, none other than Kaden Chang. I met him many years ago, and I've you know spoken with him on the same stage. And I think that he's quite interesting person. And beyond that, he has a heart. He really has a heart. Okay, so I'm gonna bring on Kaden now. Kaden, are you ready? Yes, yes. <laughs> Let's go. Hello. Hello, Kaden. Thanks for yes. agreeing to do this interview. And thank you very much. You are such an amazing person. I mean, we did thank this pre, pre-interview, like getting to know you better. I just yeah. felt really kantong. I just felt really touched when I shared with, uh, hear your sharing. And, you yeah. know, that's how we came up with this topic. How I made my dream sustainable. How you made your dream sustainable. So, Kaden, you want to share with our audience today, for those of you who don't even know who you are, and for those of you who are watching in or tuning in right now to the show or to the podcast, Kaden is super amazing, okay? He, I, I keep saying super amazing because you're super amazing. Lah. All right. So, Kaden, why don't you just share a little bit of what you're doing now? Yep. Uh, hi, uh, audience. Uh, my name is Kaden. I'm the founder of Value Investing Academy. It's a small enterprise in Singapore, and then our presence um, are also in 11 cities in the entire uh, Asia. So my role actually is quite simple. Uh, I mean, I run the companies that, that teaches, that trains people how to invest uh, very safely. Because most people who invest, they thought they're investing, but in fact, they are gambling or speculating. So we have to be very careful to differentiate between both. So um, basically, I, sh- I teach people how to do it. Yeah. So at the same time, uh, I invest in my own family fund, uh, which includes my money and my wife's money. So my wife passed my, the money to me and then I, I did the <laughs> investing. So passive income for her. Lah. So I'm the one that's working. Yeah. So, so my life yeah. is quite simple. Lah. Yeah. Then the audience, some yeah. of the audience, my friends, they will know me as a three-time cancer survivor. Yeah. So, so that's how uh, some people know me. I, I would really love love for you to share, right? When you talk about, when we said how I made my dream sustainable, I mean, I know that you're doing value investing and you're yes, using correct. things as a vehicle. And yeah. I've seen your story. But in a nutshell, how would you describe your story to your audience that you have actually gone through hardships before yeah. and you didn't have, you know, you said this, what happened in the past made me what I want in life? Would you yeah. want to share with us a little bit more on that? Uh, you're talking about the past? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Okay. So in a nutshell, um, I, was, I was born in a one-bedroom HDB flat. Yeah. So it's me, my three elder brothers, my parents. So there are about, let me see, there are six of us uh, is being squeezed in a very tiny apartment. So my father is a fishmonger. My mom is a homemaker. Uh, so in short, our family is really quite, quite humble. Uh. One source of income, which is my father, uh, who sells fishes uh, because he's a fishmonger. Yeah, so uh, there was a period of time when the government wanted to, how should I say, reallocate the HDB flats. And because of that, the, there, there isn't business in the fish market. Yeah, so my, uh, so my entire family went into really uh, deep trouble. And growing up, I mean, in a very tiny flat, uh, I went to my friend's house uh, who has like three bedrooms, four bedrooms, I've seen bungalows. And it's only during that period of time that I realized that, oh, actually, I, I was born in a poor family. 
how come my friend's house so big? How come mine is so small? I mean, if I hang out with uh, people one bedroom, right, then I wouldn't realize. I thought that that's my world. So it's only when we start uh, making comparison, then I realize that, hey, I think my family maybe maybe not doing very well. Yeah. Uh, then subsequently, as the financial issues in my family get worse and worse, uh, and I mean, I also grown up. Uh, so financially, we weren't doing very well, but I grown up, I went JC, and then the most saddest thing, uh, I mean, the, one of the saddest thing is the, how should I say? Um, I wanted to get to university. In fact, I got into NUS, uh, but my mom couldn't pay for my school fees. Uh, so I delayed one year, and then what I did was I worked for one year, raised some money, and then also not enough, so I had to borrow money from the bank. Eventually, I went to NUS. So when I went to NUS, I realized that the money that I borrowed, that I've saved, uh, is only enough to pay for the tuition fee, but it's not enough to pay for my daily expense. So for the four years, uh, I daytime as a student from about 9 a.m. to uh, about 4 p.m., right? Then at night, I start work at 6, uh, so I end at about maybe 10, 30 or 11. So I do this for four years, uh, uh, Monday to about a Saturday. The, the only time where I get to rest is about Sunday, uh. So I do this for four years. So it, it was quite difficult. It's quite difficult. So at first, I thought that I got uh, three degrees. In fact, I graduated three degrees from NES. Yeah. And my parents said that, you know, degree equals to success. Uh. So, so if I got one degree, one success. Uh. If I got three, actually, three successes. So after, after, after that, when I graduated, I realized that reality is not as such. Reality is, is degree not necessary. Uh, not necessary. It may, uh, but not necessary equals to success. So I realized that there are, all other variables in the play, like for example, the people, the kind of people that I meet, you know, like, like I met you, I met Bella, I met a lot of friends, the people that I meet, the books that we read, um, the things that we do post school. I, I think that is the key that, that determines so called what we have or what we do not have in life. And unfortunately, those things post school, it's not taught in school. Yeah, the, the school gives you some technical knowledge, give you a piece of paper, but, but the, piece of paper, the pieces of paper, unfortunately, uh, do not guarantee success. Unfortunately, unfortunately. Yeah, it may increase, yeah. but but it doesn't yeah, but, make success. Yeah, yeah, it, it help you people to get started, like have a head start. Yeah, but correct. what you may not of it will be totally different. Now, yeah. I, what have you been up to all these years? I mean, we all have done, you know, our speaking engagements in the past, and now you've moved on. And I see that one of the reasons why we are chatting today is also because you have gone online, Yay. right? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> no choice, ah. <laughs> no choice, no choice. Yeah, but oh, you see, yeah. this is this is very. I I find it very amazing for you because I mean you were very offline for a yeah, very very, very long time. Yeah, and yeah, very long time. I remember you know starting to see you you know posting on your Facebook and you said you know what I'm starting up this VIA Academy yeah. and this online and yeah. wow. And that's why James, James, we asked me, yeah. hey, you got to talk to Caden. No, now he's online. Can talk to him already because <laughs> uh, alignment, alignment. <laughs> so, so actually share with us, Caden, what actually were some of the mindset um, for you? I mean, for you from offline to go online, what were some of the mindset kind of like uh, blogs that you have, you sure. know, to, to actually go online? Yeah. So I think before I go online is, I, I, my mindset is I want to talk to people, human, face to face, face to face. So I start off in a journey offline, like trying to travel as much as I can. So can you imagine, uh, you know, in the early days uh, um, when I have the passport, right? You hardly see any stamp, you know, you know immigration, there's a stamp. Yeah, so we always dream that one day, uh, I want this whole passport uh, to be full of stamps. So that, that day came through, uh, many stamps, you know, <laughs> many stamps until I'm scared. Uh. <laughs> so so right, now, right now, the moment I hear airport, uh, I'm like, wow. Oh, Ayo, I'm going to go airport again. Uh. Ayo. So, so one month, I'm, li I'm like traveling, how should I say? Uh, maybe four times, five times. Yeah. So the most extensive traveling is I, I go to like five countries, you know, one shot, back to back. So A, B, C, D, E. Yeah. So initially, if you go one country, you feel shocked. Uh. Yeah, two countries, you still feel shocked. But if you do five countries, uh, it becomes quite robotic, like a zombie like that. Yeah. So it's only after I travel so often, uh, and then the step is too much, uh, then I realize I cannot. Uh. <laughs> if I continue to do this, uh, continue to do this, right? I think somewhere down the line I will die at the airport. So, <laughs> so I so I need to, how should I say? I, I need to increase productivity uh, by reducing my how should I say reducing my traveling time. It's too much already. Yep. So I was thinking, is there any way that I can talk to people, right? Uh, talk to more people by traveling less. Uh, I mean the only way out is online. Uh. Yeah, so so it's like Bopeno, Ghana Force. Uh. You cannot fall. So, so I, and of course, I did this before COVID 19. I was thinking, 
about it uh, for a very long time. And it's only by chance this February, I launched my book, I launched my training online. It's by chance. Uh. Then after that, COVID-19 came. Wow, so I hang on. Because if I do it <laughs> later, right? if I do it later, I oh, suffer. Cannot shoot. Eh. Lucky I shoot all the things before first. Yeah, but I was very curious because you you had all the, the F word that we are talking about. Freedom, financial independence, <laughs> you know? The funds, you know, F-U-N-D-S. Yeah. And you also yeah. have the fun. But why? Why eventually, of course, you said you have too many stamps and then you are tired. But really, I mean, if 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 it didn't happen for you, I mean, if you didn't feel that it's, it's you know, kind of like a change in the economy, change in the the way you do your classes, I mean, would you have still gone online? I, I think even without COVID-19, I would still have gone online because there, there's so much reach, as in the physical reach one person can do. Like, for example, if I travel to Japan, right? I mean, how many people can I speak in, in one day? And putting an event together, let's say you're talking about 5,000, 10,000, it, it, it's not easy. Like, there's a lot of cost, involvement, power. It's just too much work. So right now, I see online, uh, like for example, yourself, I see some of my friends, uh, wow, the reach is quite extensive, you know. So, so when I compare these two, right, it's, it seems like, uh, it seems like, uh, it seems like uh, online maybe, uh, maybe it's lesser work as compared to running a 10,000 event uh, offsite. So I think uh, in order for things to change, uh, I, I need to do some self-reflection uh, to change my belief system also. Because if I change my way of thinking, then I'll do differently. Lo. So if I do differently, maybe, right, maybe when this COVID-19 is over, I will have some, uh, I will have more, how should I say, more network. Because right now I have the online network plus the offline. But previously it was purely online. It, it was really travel, travel, travel. So now no need. La. So I'm thankful la, maybe in some ways for this COVID-19. Yeah. yeah, in two years ago, in 2018, you decide to go online, right? And then uh, yeah, now... Yeah, 2018, you, you decided to go online and then you cut down your speaking. And yeah. you actually told me that the only way to know if it works, because you were unsure, is yeah, yeah. if you actually do it. Yeah, it's to do it. Lah. <laughs> and you <laughs> invested no $20,000 in your equipment. Yeah, $20,000 uh, yeah, in the equipment. All the barang, barang. Uh. Yeah, I, I go over there to swipe only. Only my staff know what is it all about. <laughs> <laughs> I swipe a credit card near birth, so I had to bring a few credit cards to swipe. <laughs> But it's, yeah, necessary the, yeah. but it's necessary. La. But it's definitely yeah. necessary. And we see that you are now creating a hybrid self-study online yes. course that yeah. is supporting people, not just in Singapore, of course, around the world as well. Yeah. Maybe you want to share a little bit of why you want to do this hybrid kind of uh, you know, training programs that is really um, helping more people beyond uh -huh. just you, know, you being there and dropping on the passport. Yeah, I, I think the key thing, right, right now I'm still at the try and error phase. Uh try and error phase. Huh? Because originally, I'm like 100% offline and then right now, I want to move online. So, so I have this conception, I'm not very sure whether it's right or wrong, I have this conception that uh, other than the pure online where they watch something pre-recorded, right, wouldn't it be nice like, if they can talk to the person? It's like if I read a book, wouldn't it be nice if, after I read the book, maybe I can talk to the author? Yeah. So I'm just trying out. I, I, I have no idea whether it will work. It's just my thinking that maybe it will work. Huh? Yeah, so which is why I have certain uh, pre-recorded uh, training. Even though it's pre-recorded, I think it's very good for people like myself because um, I'm not a very like smart person. I, I learn things very slowly. No, you just so have three degrees only. I'm like, not very smart. <laughs> <laughs> very smart. No. <laughs> so, so, so if I, if I watch a video, right, especially investing, it's quite technical. You know? It's quite technical. So I can go back and then rewind and then play again, then rewind, play again. So for slow learner, maybe I can play like 10 times. Uh. Yeah, but if I ask the trainer, can you repeat 10 times? Huh? I think I'll get a tight slap, no? Something like that. <laughs> so, so, so they can rewind, rewind, play, play, play. Then after that, oh, can okay, kind of speak? So you also save the trainer some time because I only need to speak once huh? because they will rewind 10 times already. By the time it reaches me, uh, life is easier for me. Yeah, so, so my mm -hmm. thinking uh, is just my belief that maybe this one will work out. So I have to see you know, <laughs> if it really works out. Yeah, so I'm so very curious like also. Yeah, so you're doing all these online um, courses to help even different type of learners as well. And, yeah. you know, I mean, even for you, like you said, there are also people who are a little bit less accept, uh, like less receptive to those technical terms, how we can help them to learn better. Yeah. I think that's very uh, a very bold step for you to take because you have to really explain it really well and, yeah. and also still give them the component to add on to the life element. Now that, you know, you've done all these things in your life, you know, you've done value investing and have this academy in the past 10 years, what is your dream really? Because we talk about how to make your dream sustainable. I know, Kaden, your bank account confirm a lot of money. Yeah, that's why you can make your dream sustainable, right? People always say, Kaden, because you did it already, ma. you've already done it. You already know. 
So how did you even, you know, move into this phase and what is your dream at the end of the day? I, I, um, I think if we begin and end in mind, uh, my, my dream was uh, to, to actually, how should I say, let my company being managed by someone. Yeah. So I, I, I assume that that day comes, uh, uh, my end point comes, right? That means when I go to office, uh, I don't tell people what to do. That means there's a CEO or general manager, he, he runs the company. Uh. So my role is just to go to the office uh, and then do, things, do the things that I like. And then uh, that's it. Uh. The things that I like is I, I like to invest. I like to teach and that's it. I don't want to do anything outside this. Huh? Like, like, oh, you know, uh, what cost per click? <laughs> Some administrative things. I, I really don't want. I really don't want. I just go there. Okay, I just want to teach. Then plus invest. Then full stop. Then I go back. Eh? Yeah. So for, uh, first end point in terms of career is to let people run it. Lah. So I'm in this journey of finding someone who can do this. And the reason why I want people to run it, lah, and then I only want to do things I like, because other than the teaching and the investing part, right, uh, eventually I want to spend... Uh, as much time as possible in charity work. Uh. Yeah, charity work. I, I don't do 100% charity because I, I feel there's some form of fulfillment in the work side. So I want to do like a half work, half charity thing. And partly because I went through uh, cancer three times, it, it has shaped my thinking that eventually, like what Lee ka say. said, uh, I mean, when he retired about one, plus, one year plus ago, he once said that the, the final end point uh, for an entrepreneur uh, is to give back to society. So that sentence um, got stuck inside my head for, for one year plus. Yeah, so I, I buy that belief. So I want to reach the end point. So the end point is really for, for charity work. I mean, if I reach 70 years old, uh, what does it mean? Right? I mean, if there's an extra million, two million, uh, it, it may be a bit meaningless. Uh. Not now I say the audience don't, don't accept me, you know. Yeah. But when you reach a certain point, sometimes we think that, that there's, there's more things in life. Yeah, but, because but I, I, I like it that you are a preacher, you know, like you really a practitioner. Preacher, you, preacher and practitioner together. That means you, whatever you say, you do you do what you say. Yeah, right? you have to do a like, lot. Yeah, you are also a, a practitioner in itself. And I love yeah. that. And you talk about you do things and you like to invest 50% in your work and 50% yeah. in charity. And this... End point, end point. Yeah, yeah. this is your... Your end point. And you talk about the means goal and the end goal. That day when yeah. we were discussing this, I think sure. I love it that you can share more with our listeners today as well. You know, what does it mean for you to be a mean goal and an end goal? Um, initially, when I was in my 20s, I, I, I also cannot di- differentiate what I mean by a mean goal and an end goal. Yeah. It's just a term that I just use it for my own explanation. So when I was in my 20s, after I graduated from NUS, uh, when I was young, you know, I want to be like, famous, maybe like, maybe one day I'll be famous. Then I want to be rich because last time I was poor. Ma. So I was thinking maybe one day I'll be rich. Yeah, but I never thought if I reach that point, right, uh, what, what does it really mean? Yeah, so usually young people, they, they want this, they want that. They want something usually quite tangible. La. Yeah, it doesn't mean that's wrong, but different phases, we need different things. La. So in the early phase, I wanted that. La. But but right now, like I'm, I just turned 49 uh, yesterday, right? So, so, so after if I've achieved that, like uh, what, what does it mean? And it's also by chance that once I've treated the milestone, plus the three episodes of cancer, all this thing comes together. And when I connect the dots backward, uh, then I was thinking, I mean, if I'm lying in the hospital, right? Like, like waiting to fight, uh, fight stage four cancer, I, I wouldn't like take my PC, lock inside my account and check what is the, oh, you know, my stock position, how much money I have. I won't. Uh, I'll be thinking, oh, what should I do with my life um, when, when I'm able to, how should I say, survive the stage four cancer? And it was only through this experience that I realized that maybe, perhaps, uh, that there's more beyond this money. Uh. So maybe this money is just a means uh, to an end. And it took me quite a number of years to, uh, to understand that maybe this end uh, is to give. Is to give. So this is to give. But of course, in order for us to give, we, we must have enough. Uh. Yeah, but some people will say, hey, Kedah, you know what? Well, it's selfish, right? So I don't think it's selfish. Right? It's self-full. Uh. So it must self Yeah, so it must self-full first. Uh. You're full already, right? already you got access and access you really can give because we cannot give until our family don't have right then it's quite it's quite weird right so we just need to prioritize that not everything is fine family is taken care of then we got extra la. extra it can be time or whatever then then we can give uh. yeah so the giving part is the end uh. so the like working hard some tangible resources that one is the mean uh. so it's a mean to an end yeah mm. so 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 well, the answer as a driving force uh. Yeah, but what about those people who say, you know, Kaden, I only want to do charity work and I don't really want to make money. You know, making money is not important. I mean, put it into the context where, like you said, the meat, like you're, you're full sure. versus, you know, it's the cup is empty, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like, how do we balance that that thing within people who also want to 
happy. Like you have a dream that is sustainable. Yeah. You know, you build up a treasure trove of recurring yeah. passive income perpetually until yeah. a certain point. And, you know, and then you are committing your life, your end in life to really do 50% of a charity, which you told me that is for cancer research and palliative yeah. care. Yeah, that's my dream. Yeah, that's my end point. End, end point. No more. It's nothing beyond that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I think the, the key thing is uh, that there's no right or wrong. Uh. I, I mean, if somebody, they, they have a good job, everything is fixed, they want to charity, can they can do it in their own way. For example, they can be a char- uh, do charity in terms of volunteering. Uh, volunteering. Yeah. So they, they become a small piece, right, of, uh, of an organization. Yep. They can play a part in an organization. So that is also okay. So my thinking is if I want to make a greater impact, greater impact, like, like lobby for certain change. Yeah. So I want people to hear my voice. So if I want people to hear my voice, uh, first thing I must see, who is this Jack Ma look alike? Ma? So I, I, I mean, who is this Jack Ma look alike? I mean, why should they hear me, right? Why? Why should they hear me? Of tons of people, why should they hear me, right? So it's a good question. And it's also a very tough question for me to answer. Yeah. Why should they hear me, right? I, I'm not handsome. Like, like many years, I, I'm not rich. I'm not this. I'm not that. So why should they hear me? So, so it, was, it, it was this question that I need to answer. I was thinking maybe, uh, maybe just maybe if I work hard and if one day uh, some people know me, maybe not a lot. If some people know me, then when I say something, right, maybe at least 10 people will, will buy, buy my idea versus one person. Yeah, but, but, but from one person to influencing one person to 10 person, 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, eh, I need to, how should I say, I need to work hard for it, lah. Yeah, work hard to become maybe uh, maybe a tiny little somebody. So then when I make a voice, uh, people say, maybe let me hear what Kaden is saying. Yeah. So so if I can be a better person, right, I can influence more people. Yeah. But before that, I think people need to how should I say, change the belief uh, that actually doing well in life in terms of monetary business, your job, right? And doing things charity charity work can coexist. Uh, because you look at all the richest people in the world, they they, they coexist, right? Yeah, so Lee Kashi didn't say, ah, yeah, to do charity, I better go back to when, you know, 50 years ago when I'm poor. I, I don't think so, right? You, you can balance both. Huh? I think the question is not whether um, uh, can or cannot. The question is how, how to balance both. Yeah, so, so it's not can, cannot, it's how. Once you mm-hmm. ask the question how to do it, oh, then you start figuring the answer. Uh, it may not be easy and it may take years. Yeah, but again, the, like just now, Janisha was saying, uh, the only way to find out is, is just to do it. Lah. You do, 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 then one day you will know. <laughs> yeah, and I, I love it that you are committed to cancer research and palliative, <clears throat> and palliative care. Yeah. And, and yeah. I believe that your mom has a strong influence on you. The situation where you shared with me about, you know, someone was there to give you that support that, you know, many people were not looking at what you're going through, but this group of people actually looked at you and said, I just want to help you. Share yeah. with us this story and, and how you eventually do what you do and decided yeah. what you do. Yeah. I, I think my, my mom, right? My mom passed away when I was uh, uh, during my fourth year, fourth year. So I'm 49, degree and high, I should be maybe 22, 23. So it's been more than 20 plus years ago. I think the, my mom, uh, like you say, has, has really huge influence on how, how I shape. And the greatest influence was during the last phase of her life. Yeah, so during my fourth year, she was diagnosed with uh, stage four lung cancer, and I was the first person in the family to know. Yeah, so uh, I brought her to the doctor, and then the doctor t- t- uh, told me uh, in English, right? He said, "Oh, your mom has cancer," and but he refu- he refused to spell the word cancer. He said, "Your mom has C A N C R." Yeah, and then asked me to translate in Teochew, you know. So I have to turn and look at my mom. My mom looked at me. Hey, what did the doctor say in Teochew? So I have to like talk to her. You know, it was very difficult. But I told a lie. I told a white lie. I say, the doctor said that you have uh, lungs in the water. But eventually, I, I'm the first person to her um, that she's going to pass on. And the doctor said um, she has only had three months. Yeah. So uh, when my mom was dying, uh, how should I say? It, it was very difficult for me and my three other brothers. Huh? Yeah. So we are in the house and then she will cry every day. It's like, it's like watching a flower, right? Original flower, it looks very nice, right? And then the petals start to turn you know, yellowish, brown, and then the leaves start to fall. Yep. So eventually, she, she was a proper human being, able to live day to day, right? And then eventually, she sat in a wheelchair and then lying on the, the medical bed. So during this process, because our family is quite bad, yeah, it's always during our darkest days, then you see who, who is there for us. Yeah. And the interesting thing is the people who are there for us are strangers. 
can, can you believe it? It's like you expect somebody uh, very close to be there, right? But they are strangers. Eh? The, the strangers, I mean, why would a stranger, uh, how should I say, help, help, help people like me, right, my mom? So who is the stranger that actually helped? It's actually an organization called Hospice Care Association. Yeah. So the Hospice Care Association, HCA, sent a doctor. I mean, a doctor is a stranger, right? But the doctor came. Yeah. Then they sent a counselor. The counselor is a stranger, right? But the counselor came. So the HCA and organization also stranger to us. Ma. But, but they gave them. And then when they give, they send the doctor, we pay nothing. No? They give us medicine, everything. All, all free. Eh. I mean, why would, why would anyone send a doctor to my house? It should be quite expensive, right? Because medicine, everything should be expensive. Right? But it's all for free. And then eventually when my mom passed away, unfortunately, eh, a hospice care association never like asked anything back. That like, they didn't say, hey, remember one year ago, I give you something, right? Can you please do something back in return? They, they never say this. So, um, because they didn't say, and it took me 20 years you know, to realize, in this world, how come there are people who give uh, without asking anything in return? How can that be, right? In a business world, when people ask, uh, when people help you, right, they say, hey, you help me back, huh? If not, you owe me a favor. So, so in the business world, there's always like, I give you A, you give me A plus something. But the, in, the, in the charity world, right, uh, there are always people who give. La. But when they give, not necessarily it's money. Like the doctor give time. Yeah, the counselor was a, was a part-time uh, person. He, she also give time. So you see, these are people who give. They, they also make a balance between their work and then giving. The doctor also, you know, balance. So, so it's because of this, right? Uh, it took me 20 years later, I realized that, hey, I realized 20 years ago, a hospice care association gave me something, right? Yeah, but, but for the past 20 years, I got nothing to give. Uh. I, I nothing. I uh, empty, yeah. Uh empty so right now my, my cup uh, is full uh, got some extra so i went back to hospice care association and i spoke to the ceo i say i want to do something back uh, but i do not know what to do can you tell me what can i do yeah so they say first thing uh, don't come don't bring your guys come to hca and sing song uh. avoid that because our beneficiary they don't want to hear a uh, song why don't you bring them up yeah so we brought them up to the gardens by the bay yeah i do i do all the planning the organization i paid for the meals Yep, the going to the gardens by the bay, you know the dome, right? Yep, the tickets. The ticket was uh, sponsored by the HCA. Yep, so we volunteered the meals, the time, and so on. But I think one of the biggest lessons that I have uh, after this whole event was over, right, is throughout this four or five hours, uh, the patients were happy. Right? Yeah, the patient was happy. I mean, how can the patients be happy, right, when they know that they're going to die, right? How, 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 can it, how can it be, right? But I cannot go there and ask, uh, why, why are you so happy? Uh? You know, I cannot ask this, right? Yeah, so I, I, have to, I have to observe, I have to do my conclusion. Why are they happy when they know that they're going to die? Maybe, maybe it's got nothing to do whether they die or like. Maybe they have chosen to be happy. Yeah, which is during this COVID-19, right? Yeah, some people, they may why, yeah, okay, then my business got affected, which may be true, which may be true. So now the question is, how, how can we like, maybe we will not do better before pre-COVID-19, but we, we can do something. We can do something. Let's do something. But in order for us to do something, we must choose our emotional state. Yep. So like the patient, they chose to be happy. Yep. So, so throughout the four or five hours, they were very happy until the end. Until the end uh, at the unloading bay, at the loading unloading bay, the two mini buses came, a lorry came. Uh, we put them up on the mini bus and then we put the wheelchair up on the lorry. And then I realized that the bus, the, the buses didn't go off. So I was thinking, how come they didn't go off? Because they were waiting for the volunteers to come. We have about maybe 30 plus volunteers. So when the volunteers come, we, we look at them, you know. And, and in between two groups, uh, we didn't say anything. It's a very, it's a very strange, uh, I also don't know how, a very, very emotional uh, feeling. So I was looking at them. They were looking at us. So, so we just like look at each other for, for a few seconds. Then eventually they wave. Eh. They wave. After they wave, oh, I cried, you know. <laughs> don't know why, I also don't know why. After they wave, they cry. Like, and then they were happy. Like, how can you be happy, right? You wait to me, you, you, you make me cry. Like, how can you be happy, right? Then after that, they wait, wait, the door closed. Like. Then after the door, door closed, like, the two buses go out. Oh, I cry even louder. Then I realized that when I cry, my, my, some of my volunteers will cry. Wow, then I was thinking, what was going on with me? Then it took me a while to understand that um, that, that will be the last time I'll see on them. Because, a, I mean, hospice, that means their lifespan most likely will be trauma and less. And it's been so many years. Uh. So in other words, those uh, 30 plus patients that we have so-called brought them out, uh, I, I, I suppose none of them are, are around today. Uh. Yeah, but no. you see, the key thing is, but, but I'm around. Uh. You, see, you see, they went through cancer, right? Once. They are not around. I went through cancer three times. I'm around. 
I mean, why, why should I be around, right? I, I should join them, right? So, so I think uh, after the three rounds of cancer, I think I'm a, I'm a free thinker. La. So I'm telling myself, I think uh, whether one year, two years, three years, I think I better do the best with whatever time I have. That, that's how that, that dream about 50% you know, work and then the charity. Because eventually the charity has to be funded by something. La. I don't want to go around like trying to beg for money. So if, uh, if this dream come true, then at least my investment or at least my small enterprise uh, could fund my charity work. Uh, then, then, then isn't it nice, right? Uh, I could do something that I like and then I can still do some good. Uh, to me, uh, to me, this appears to be a perfect model, but, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> it's just my you, dream. You are, you are getting there. <laughs> yeah, I'm on my way, on my way. Yeah. But right now, right now, I mean, you are already having this, uh, you talk about having a capital and then an investment yeah. of return uh, yeah. when you put your money in for yeah, value yeah. investing and then sure. now you're also a donor for Cancer Center. And even yeah, a time like this is is uh, so tough, you know, and yeah. you, you mentioned something that made my heart just really, wow, you know, cadence is integrity You know, it made me feel that way. So tell us a little bit what happened during this season of COVID-19 where everybody say, oh, business no good, you know, it's very terrible. What do you yeah. do that you made a commitment and you kept your word? Yeah, it was, um, I, I think it was, it should be end last year, like end last year. Um, one of the staff at the NCCS uh, who happens to be my graduate uh, for my NLT course and value investing course, yeah, she was saying that, you know, every year we always wanted to raise money uh, for a National Cancer Center. So they say that this year, this year, right, they wanted to do like a charity dinner. Charity dinner. So that was way before COVID-19 when, when life was good. Uh, so at a point in time, uh, she said very nicely, uh, we need X dollars. Uh. I mean, the sum is not a lot. It's not like millions. You need X dollars. So I say, okay. Lor. So remember, I say, okay, during good times. Eh. <laughs> it's like good times uh, where everything goes well. Ay, yeah, chin la, also can. La. You know, uh, okay, la, okay. La. Then after that, this COVID-19 came. Uh, of, of course, when this COVID-19 came, the NCCS didn't come back uh, and say, hey, Kaden, remember the promise that you say? I, I mean, they, they didn't come back. I, I think they're also nice. Uh, but whether they come back to us uh, or they didn't come back, it doesn't really matter. It's, the key thing is a promise is a promise. Uh. Yeah, this, this is quite important. Uh. This, a, a promise is a promise. So, so if I promise to buy you a cup of coffee, I need to buy you a cup of coffee. Yeah. So like, like for example, I, I have a few staff, right? So, so I told them I'll do my best uh, no matter what happened, right? Uh, I, I will keep your jobs. My priority is to keep your job and to give you full salary. Yeah. And, and saying it's easy. Like, like, like make, make promise very easy. You right? just tell anyone, hey, I will do this. Uh. But keeping the promise is very difficult, especially when we are struggling. We are struggling. If you are struggling, right? And then yet you want to keep this promise, it's very difficult. Uh. It's very difficult. But, but I just felt... Because there are only two ways around it. Number one is we keep to this promise and then we bite the bullet until the end. Yep. Then the second one is we break this promise. Huh? But I cannot imagine myself breaking this promise. Huh? Even if I have a good reason to do so. I, I, I just felt if I break this promise at night, I cannot sleep. Huh? So, so to, to sleep better, I think I better keep to this promise. Yeah. So I think keeping promise is quite important. Huh? Even though we are going through uh, hard times. Yeah, and you had a friend, you have a friend in, in charity, I mean, because uh, I remember you told me a story about how this person, you know, when you did charity, oh. you couldn't understand the logic of why must you thank people who receive it. Because when you organize an event, I think a yoga event, and nobody really showed up for this uh, yeah, yeah, right, event. Right. Yeah, share with us a little bit about this experience and what was the main lesson in yeah. this whole entire journey? Yeah, after my second episode of stage four cancer, I wanted to organize to help cancer patients. Uh. So, so I tried various ways. Uh. It took me six months, uh, but nothing worked out. Uh. So there are only a few, uh, few people who came out. So the few people who came out is they want to support me. Uh, otherwise, my class is quite empty, right? Then I feel quite a bit sad, uh, a bit sad. So I wanted to find a role model to, to share with me like, how to do it. So eventually, I contacted uh, this organization called Kampong Sinang. They're still around. They can Facebook this person, uh, this organization. So I... I sent a private message via the fan page. So interestingly, the founder called me. Eh? The founder is called Joyce. Eh? Joyce called me over the phone. So over the phone, I was telling her, hey, I want to do this. Eh? Like, very enthusiastic. Hey, but no one came. Eh? It's like, I give free. Eh? Free, you don't want to come. Eh? You know that I got this mindset. Eh? Free, eh? you don't want to come. Yeah. So, so she said she, she said a very nice, very zen way. She's like a mother Teresa. So she said, um, when we organize things and we give people free, right? We give people free, yeah? They can choose not to come. 
which is true, then we say that because they have a choice not to come, if they choose to come, we must be grateful to them. Wow, that few seconds I was thinking, eh, I give you free, uh, you take. I still have to be grateful to you. Uh. Wow, what kind of logic is this? Wow, I was thinking, it, it, it's, like I, it's like I give rise uh, to the low income. Then after I give, uh, I still have to be thankful to you. You know, usually when you give rise, you, you expect the, like, the senior people to be thankful to you. You, you know, something like, yeah. So she yeah, changes my... You give, because you give, ma. Yeah, correct. So she changes my mindset mm. because when I give, right, I should expect nothing in return. And if they say thanks, now the moment they say thanks, right, is they are giving something back, right? If they give something back to us, whether verbally or whatever, right, we should be thankful to them. So, so that is giving. So I realized that, oh, giving is not giver. Then you want to show up like, oh, like I'm some big deal. Like, like you want something. something. Giving is you give. Lah. Then after that, I mean, if people say thanks, then, you, then it's okay. Lah. If people don't say thanks, then you should also be thankful. Lah. Because they give us an opportunity eh, to give. Yep. So when I, when I want to help uh, like National Cancer Center, sometimes they say, Kaden, are you free to share your story at this event? Okay, I'll go. But when I go, I don't expect, hey, I go there and CCS say thanks. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. No problem. Man. So I give, uh, I need nothing. I can quietly go in and I can quietly leave. It's okay. As long as I keep to my promise, I do my part right. Uh, I, I'm happy already. <laughs> so self-satisfied. No, no need thanks. No need thanks. Yeah. So that's I, my, I, my way of doing things. I, I, I love it the, how you talk about, you know, um, this story. And I love it that this person has, you know, shared about, you know, thank the person whom yeah. received, right? Yes, and exactly. on your journey as a cancer patient and survivor, I mean, looking at all these pieces and milestones that you have gone through, I'm just thinking how have it impacted you in terms of investing? Because making dreams sustainable, ultimately all these pieces that we are talking about goes back to, how sustainable we are, yeah. are we providing for our family? Because in Soulage Women, talk about the F word, right? Being fabulous, yeah. having freedom, financial independence, and above all, family. How yeah. has it changed the way you look at value investing? I, 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 after the three episodes of cancer, I realized that anything could happen overnight. Let, let me give you an example. I'm supposed to see the doctor this Thursday, the real story. So I'm supposed to see an oncologist. So before I see an oncologist, tomorrow I'm supposed to go for a blood test. Yeah, blood tests uh, to see certain uh, markers. Yeah. So after I do the blood test, uh, you, you see, I, I do not know the results. And the only thing I know is this Thursday. And it's quite scary one, you know. Yeah, it's quite scary. It's uh, every three months I do do this. Eh. So one year I do do this four times. Yeah. So, so, so after I get a blood test, I'm supposed to go to a clinic. And the clinic is you sit outside, yeah. sit outside right, with the fellow cancer patient. So when you turn left and right, some people go through chemo, they got no hair, and then I got hair right there, I should be grateful. Then there is a number on top. Number, the tang tang, you know, my number that I go in. So the moment I go in, uh, the first one, two seconds, uh, wow, it's like a judgment day. Eh. What do you mean by judgment day? When I go in, uh, the doctor will say, Mr. Chang, sit down. So sit down. Yeah, sit down. Uh. After I sit down, right, the one second, uh, it all depends on what the doctor say. If the doctor, if, if the blood, blood test is clear, the scan is clear, they'll quickly say, Mr. Chang, you're okay. They always say the good things first. Now, but if it's not okay, uh, Oh, you know, eh? because the first few seconds they say, Mr. Chang, I got something to tell you. Well, the moment you say, I got something to tell you, that's it. Because if you got nothing to tell you, it's nothing. Lah. If they got something, it's something not good. Lah. Yeah. So every time I go in, it's a toss of coin. Lah. So it's because of that, I know that toss of coin lah, is like dead or alive. Things could uh, appear overnight. And if I take this to investing, it's the same thing. Lah. Now, today, if we have 1 million, so what? I mean, if you, if you invest in the wrong thing, you make the wrong decision, the, the money could just uh, vanish overnight. Like, for example, in 2001, uh, my 50K, right? Stockholm bubble burst, uh, vanish overnight. Eh? Yeah, so, so life can be taken from us overnight. Money, uh, we can spend 20 years, right? Saving, right? Or investing, right? It can be taken away from us overnight. So in terms of investing, uh, you guys could relate the lesson. Uh, is the key thing in, in investing, right? Is not to make money. It's to make sure that we don't lose it. Yeah, because losing money is easy. Making money is very difficult. And in order for us not to lose it, uh, we need to be very conservative. Uh. We cannot treat investing like a tikam, like gambling, right? Trying to bet odd or even, high or low. We must be very careful, do our due diligence. And throughout these 10 years, uh, I've seen people uh, treating investing uh, oh, like anyhow, you know. Like for example, I got one uh, old uncle, right? He just take 150K, which is 50% of his life savings. Uh. Anyhow, we're hamtam one company. And then the company didn't do well, which is high flux. Uh. Then half of, half of his savings gone, right? Then the other half, I go and work another Singapore company. Yeah. So half, half, 
all gone. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, I also don't want to say the irony in life is then his son also jilted uh, the family. La. So throughout these 10 years, other than teaching investing, I also realized that people lose things overnight very quickly. Man. Yeah, so I have to be very careful about money and also very careful about life. La. And then uh, other than this so-called be conservative, uh, and I also need to be, how should I say, uh, uh, I also need to be humble. La. Humble. Yeah, be, be, because things can vanish overnight. So it's like, don't want to be too haole, no? Because nobody will, will be at the top forever. If somebody is very famous, uh, I mean, they cannot be famous for the next 100 years. One day, people will forget about them. New young people will come, take over them. They will be forgotten already. So I think when we are up there, right, I think we stay humble. Uh, we, we help people. And then we are down at the bottom. Uh, like For example, COVID-19, uh, we are down at the bottom. Don't go and, how should I say, indulge in your sorrows. Uh. Yeah, unfortunately, the reality is, I don't think anybody is interested to listen to our sorrows. Uh. Yeah, they don't want that. Ayah, it's so tam. Ayah, also so tam. Let's tam together. I mean, there, there, there is no point, right? You, you want to say, come, let, let's, let's sort, sort things up. How, how can we make this a, uh, how should I say, a better situation? Yeah, don't, don't, yeah, don't so I, indulge your sorrows. Yeah, correct. I, and I'm very curious, okay, I mean, like we talk about the doctor incident, uh, you went you, this Thursday and then there are four times a year that you go and see a doctor and that <laughs> yeah, changes yeah. the way you look at in value investing as well. Yeah. well. Are you actually scared? I mean, as a man, for yeah. yourself, for your family, for the portfolios that you've built up, yeah. are you actually scared? Uh, I, I'm not, how should I say, yeah? Uh, because the administrative part has already been taken care of, uh, because all my investment account are joint account. Yeah, so I, I'm quite scientific, uh, how should I say, operational. Uh. So, so after I went through three cancer, I already know what are the things I need to plan. Yeah, so for example, uh, if I pass away, what will happen? So I already all the work, the will is being written, the, how should I say, the account is, uh, is all joined. So in case I pass away, my wife will automatically take over. Yeah, so doing a review, how much percent is going to give away, how much percent. So, so everything all done, right? Yeah, everything all done. Uh. Yeah. Then, um, the, during my second episode of stage 4 cancer, uh, while the next day is the surgery, right? So I took a plastic bag, right? NTUC plastic bag, quite cheap skate. Uh. Then I put all the ATM bank, uh, ATM card inside, right? Then I, I write the, the pin. Uh, the pin. All the pin, whatever. So I told my wife, uh, if next day I go in, cannot come out. Uh. You go and press the pin, withdraw all the money. Yeah. So... A, all this administrative is sorted out. Uh. So I, I'm not so worried about if I die, my money will be vanished. So I know it will be given to somebody. Yep. So this I know that more. you told me the story about you <laughs> You go into the operating theater and then you yeah, never, yeah. you think that you'll never wake up. That part actually really scared me, you know. I, I thought I would be scared whether if I were to be pushed into the operating theater and then I'll be talking and then if the mask goes on with the an aesthetic where I'll be put yeah. to sleep. Yeah. You die not knowing that you died. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is true. Eh? Because that's what happened to my, to my father. My father went to the fish market, sell fish. Eh? Afternoon, she took a nap. Uh, I mean, he took a nap. After he took a nap, he never woke up. Then after that, he just passed on. Yeah, so the... How should I say? Uh, it, 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 uh, things could just uh, happen overnight. So because of all these small, small things, same as my mom. My, my mom didn't pass away overnight. It was a one-year journey. And then one year journey was very tormenting uh, for both uh, my mom and my, myself. Uh. I, I, I mean, uh, I was young, I was in my 20s. I've never been a caregiver. I have no idea how to take care of a person, right? Who is dying. I mean, how, how, what, what to say? I also don't know what to say. You mean go there, inspire the person? Cannot, uh, the person is dying, not, not you, you know? So, so it, it's, it's difficult. And, and of course, it's going through all this difficult journey it, it shapes my way of thinking so that in future when something worse happens, right, I know how to handle it. Or when some of my friends, my graduate told me their story, I, I feel connected with them. Uh. So, so this is like some side benefit. Uh. Yeah. And yeah. by going through whatever you have gone through, you talk about value investing, how this uncle you know, took half, 50% yeah. and 50%. I yeah. just feel very sad for this case because my dad also put money into investments. And because of that, that was one of the reasons why I, I had to support myself through school since I was 14 yeah. years old. It's not right, because sorry. we were poor from start. It was because my dad lost a lot of money and, and that really put a phobia in, in terms of investing in, yeah. in, in my life moving forward. So for you, I mean, how are you how would you encourage someone to even get started in value investing? I mean, I love the part when I attended your online webinar and online class. Yeah. You talk about 
people buy things not knowing what's in the shopping bag. Yeah, correct. Yeah, which maybe is, you want is, to. Which is funny. Yeah, I, I love that that metaphor. <laughs> I absolutely love it because I totally get it. People buy a mess, Birkin, LV, not knowing what exactly they are going to get. They're going to like wait, order for the bag and wait for one year later. Ta -da, the color and yeah. the bag design will be different from what they are looking at. So I just want to you to share with our listeners and our audience today, you know, what is all these pieces all about and how can someone take a step and understand value investing? I, I, I think the, um, there's no much way out is whenever we want to embark on a journey, right, to, to learn new things, uh, we, we just have to learn. Uh. For example, if I, many years ago, I don't have a driving license. So in order for me to drive, I have to go through this journey, right, or you know, go to the driving school and then drive. It requires effort, yes. It requires time, yes. Um, does it require some money for me to pay for the instructor? Yes. All, all this is required. But, but as a doubt, we make a choice, man. We, we want to drive a car, of course, we have to go through this journey, right? So if we want to have a backup plan, like you look at this COVID-19, companies are closing, some people lose their job, got pay cut. And then if you got no backup plan, uh, then how? Uh, you cannot wait until the crisis comes, then you prepare. It's too late. Really. You always want to prepare before the crisis comes. But if you want to prepare for, before the crisis comes, you want to prepare to drive a car, then you must make a choice. First, you must make a choice that, hey, I want to learn driving. So same thing. Hey, I want to learn swimming. Hey, I want to learn investing. So after you make a, a conscious de a decision that you want to learn driving, okay, where should I go and learn driving? Where should I learn uh, investing? So of course, you want to learn from someone who has driven, right? So same thing. You want to learn from someone who has really invested. So, ta -ta -ta, buy a book then, cannot. Uh. You, want to, <laughs> you want to learn from someone uh, who has all his money in the stock market. So that when he practices, uh, he, he also experiences what he's experiencing. So once you're able to find this person, who, whoever that is, uh, then the next stage is um, that, that person that you met uh, could, could save years of his journey. Because in 2001, when my net, network was negative 50K, uh, until right now, it's 19 years, you know. So some people say, hey, Kiran, investing, borrow a book, borrow a book, watch a free YouTube video. Of course you can, but you spend 19 years, oh. Yeah, like, like my two girls, right? I cannot tell my two girls, hey, two girls, huh? go and watch a YouTube video swimming. Go to swimming pool, jump inside, swim yourself. Can, but it takes them time, right? So, so investing, you, you mean you want to watch your YouTube and then you hum thumb your life savings inside? Yeah? Like, cannot, right? So you, you want to be safe. So it's either you save time uh, by learning from someone that, that shortens your journey. La. Then after you have learned something, you, you learn how to drive. Yep. Then the key thing is to drive. Ma. So if you got a driving license, uh, you never drive the car out of the Bukit Batok driving center, right? Eh? Then, then, then your driving collect dust. La. Cannot be, right? So you learn investing is to invest, man. you must press buy. But when you press buy the very first time uh, when you drive out right, the triangular plate, uh, if there's someone beside you, you also feel better. So in the world of investing, I will be beside you. Lo. So in case you forgot to step on the brake, I step for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the instructor usually have a spare brake by the side. Yeah. So, so I, I, I think in the learning journey, there will be some learning curve. But if there's someone uh, beside you, right, like you supporting uh, all your followers, I think that will be easier. La. Yeah, so not so scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, for for the mystery bag, I, I just want mystery to explore bag. this uh, very interesting metaphor because Kaden, you know, we have listeners in fifty three countries, and yes. I feel that when we talk about investing, is such a is it's not that foreign, but it's not what we see in the FB yeah. ads or YouTube ads. Yeah. So maybe can you tell us the story and explain the metaphor a little bit? I mean, I just want to dig a little bit deeper for our listeners today so that we can get all the goodies, all right? Um, which is the mystery bag metaphor that you used. Share with us more on that. Yeah. So when people buy something in a shopping mall, for example, right, if you want to buy a shirt, right, buy a shirt, huh? so I, I'll buy the shirt, I'll go inside and test. It's, it's like I do my due diligence, make sure that it's fit, the length, everything is okay. Then other than that, like, you will go out and ask the lady, hey, do you have a new piece? Yeah, so the lady say, yes, I have a new piece. She pass you a new piece. If she doesn't, right, she say, oh, that's the last one. Eh. So if the last one, what do I do? I, I, I go and examine every single thing. or oh, the button, whether the button come out, whether there are any stitches, any hole. So I go through my due diligence. Yeah, maybe I spend like 20 minutes. Eh, just, just to do what? Just to buy one shirt. Eh. So maybe the shirt is $50. So 20 minutes, $50 shirt. Yeah. But you see, in investing, is is quite irony. Investing is like they go to a shopping mall and then they saw this paper bag 
or a plastic bag. And then the paper bag is on sale, 100,000. Then you just go there, 100,000. Ah, yeah, chin chai lor. Like less than 20 minutes and maybe 20 seconds, maybe 5 seconds. You just pass the 100K to the sales girl and then you buy. After you buy, you go back home, then you open up. Hey, what's inside? But, but this is what people do. They, they got 100K, which is their life saving. Then they ask the stockbroker. The stockbroker say, buy what? Oh, the stockbroker say, A, A is good. A is good. But you never ask why it's A. A is good. Sure. I trust you. I trust you. Then they go back home, 100K, press buy in a few seconds. Then after that, when the, when they, when the company closed, then they go and open the bag. Then when they open the bag, inside got rotten things. It's too late already. Then what do you do? You want to blame the broker, but you cannot blame the broker because the broker say good, but you must do a uh, due diligence. Right? You, you mean when the uncle say durian is good, you never open up and check. You just take the durian, go back, and it cannot be right. You want to do a due diligence. So in a world of investing, uh, interesting, huge sum of money, they just use a split second decision. Yeah, but when they buy small, small little things, uh, yo, they spend so much time trying to figure out uh, whether the button is correct. Uh, so it becomes like very young like that. So which is quite irony. Uh. Yep. So investing, mm. in fact, we should spend more time. We should spend hours. We shouldn't be spending 20 seconds. Yeah. Mm. So that, okay, that's so, the metaphor. <laughs> yeah. So do they need to spend more hours looking at that thing? But what is that herd instinct when, you know, uh, we talk about now is the time to 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 buy something and then yeah. someone say, hey, this is one very good. Leh. Ah, very good. So they just want to tompang. You know, ah. like, you know, because it's psychology part, right? Like yes, someone says, this one very good and then they just buy. Could it be because of that reason like why people just chung ah, to make their purchase 100k in just a split second? Could that be the reason why? Because someone said that it was good versus yeah. what it's a versus I do the work myself. Yeah. So um, going along the line, uh, just imagine, right, for the audience, you just imagine that you enter a room. Uh, so if the room got 10,000 people, if uh, 9,999, uh, say it's good, right? It's very difficult for you to say it's bad. Uh, because you'll be thinking if, if 99% uh, say it's good, right? How, how can you say it's bad? Right? You contradict the majority. But the interesting thing is majority lose money. Ma. The majority lose money in stock market, right? Now, if, if majority are right, majority should be making money. So what does it mean? It simply means that inside the room, 99% uh, in fact are the ones that lose money. So we have to be very careful. But, but uh, there is a psychological barrier because if 99% rush to the right side, right, to, to sell something, uh, you want to very garang go to the left side alone uh, to press buy. It's very difficult. Yeah, because you're going against the type. So you go to the left and then the right. Like, it's very difficult. So in order for you to have the courage to say, hey, 99% are wrong, uh, I'm right. Yeah. So in order for us to, to, be, to be courageous and say that we are right, it has to be leveraged on something. It has to cling on something. And one of the key things we cling on is the homework that we do. So we need to know, we open up the bag. Hey, what's inside? Uh, yeah, this one, very good. Or oh, this one, very lousy. So you do your homework. Eh? But the rest, you don't know, right? Because you do your homework, eh, you, you are very clear that you make a sound decision. And when you make a sound decision, that you're right. Eh, and you don't care about what people think. You only care about yourself. Because nobody cares more about our money eh, than ourselves. So we make our own decision. Let me give you one specific example. Recently, uh, like all my peers, uh, keep talking about SIA. Like. Oh, SIA, no rights issue right now. The greatest problem, share price very low. Should they buy? So first thing I ask them, uh, very easy. Hey, you know SIA do what? No? You, you know exactly what they do. So I'm asking them, do you know, do you know what's inside? Outside the plastic bag, put SIA, right? But you need to open up. Uh, do you know what's inside? Yeah, good things, rotten things, do you know? So they say, don't know. Don't know, you still ask me <laughs> whether to buy SIA or not. You shouldn't ask me. You should ask yourself, do you know? If you don't know, please go and find out, go and read or whatever, or, or going back to take some training, find a mentor or whatever. So we have to, it's like when we marry someone, we find a good friend, we, we how should I say, we want to find a spouse. We have to do our due diligence for, for everything. We cannot change, I just make a decision. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to swing this question over to your family side. I mean, knowing all these uh, aspects of value investing, sure. how is your wife involved in a part of this uh, decision making in investing is she also in, in a part of this decision making because i mean i from for us we talk about family right then it's yeah. not just women only because soul rich women talk about women but we, I, we also believe having the family together who learns together who invests together stays together so uh, what does your wife do in this part of aspect of value investing in your own portfolio for your family fund i i, I think my wife um 
pay attention to, to what I do. La. Yeah. So every time when I go back, I will say, hey, I found this, I will found this. Yeah. Then uh, then whether she she want to use the money to do anything, I let her decide. La. I let her decide. But we have a like a common pool to support our, our kids. La. So, yeah, she, so take, she, um, she gives you the money and then you invest and then she decides <laughs> what to do with the money. Oh, very good, eh? Like that. <laughs> so, so she's a very, how should I say? Uh, she takes a very third party position. Uh. Yeah, mm-hmm. whether in terms of money or whether dealing with my cancer or, or whether dealing with me. Uh, because I'm a very stubborn person. And she knows that I'm, I'm very stubborn. Sometimes I think in a certain way and I behave in a certain way. So because she, she knows that if she nye, nye, come and how should I say? Uh, if she's also stubborn, uh, I think both of us quite difficult to uh, stay married for, for, for a long time. So we are able to manage each other. It's because we, we how should I say? Uh, she, she learned to take a few steps back whenever she saw I'm going through some trouble. And then she hardly get pissed off. Uh, but if I do uh, see her pissed off, uh, she must be pissed off. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so in, investing, she takes uh, like a third party, very chill. Okay, what have you been doing? I'll, I'll tell her. Then in terms of the emotional right, uh, she also uh, quite calm. Uh, and, and she said that, uh, she said that I, I know you're the person going through cancer. I may not be able to give you any advice because I'm not the person going through. Yeah, but well, I will always be with you. And she knows that if I don't want to talk, she won't ask me hey, to say something. Like, yeah, she, she won't. But if, if I want to talk, she knows that I, I will go and purposely talk to her. Hey, I, I, want, to, I want to say something to you. Yeah, but, but she, she always wants to be present, physically present, emotionally present around me. So I think I'm, I'm really grateful like, because it's not easy to endure a personality like me. And then going through cancer three times and then go broke. Oh my goodness. Uh, need, need, a, need a tough woman. Like. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and how long have you been married? Uh, we, we got married in 2001 uh, when the dot-com bubble burst and I told a story in the press when I lost my 50k. So can you imagine I have to borrow 50k from my wife, which is my girlfriend, uh, who was my girlfriend, to, to marry her. So, so after we got married in 2001, uh, my net worth negative 50k. So her net worth zero. Lo. So I mean, why would anyone want to marry somebody and then they have to lend him money? Uh, not, this is quite bad, right? Yeah, so so I suppose she also value investor. She see long term. Yeah, yeah, she value investor in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So so now we're some return. Now. In you. <laughs> so now some return. Now return. Now got return. Yeah. Yeah, this so, is very good. So, so nineteen years. Uh, nineteen years. Uh, we have two girls. A uh, my younger girl is uh, primary three. The second one is primary six. Uh, I'm quite fortunate. Uh, I have nothing much much more to ask. Mm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, I really enjoy your story so much. Okay, so um, I have got a question for you that I ask all my guests. Sure. To you, who and what is a soul rich woman? Um, I, I, I think a soul rich woman, um, like, like the terms, right, is they are rich in the soul. Yeah, rich in the soul. When I say rich in the soul, I can break out into two things. Uh. One is the heart portion and one is the mind portion, the brain portion. The brain portion as in like doing things, be, you know, uh, like plan out, there's a balance between business, you know. So all the tangible things. Uh. But the key thing is if, if people are rich, uh, like your term, like so rich women, if they are rich women, but without a soul, it's quite, it's quite funny, right? They become empty rich women. That, that's quite <laughs> funny, right? Yeah, That's empty a good rich one. woman. Yeah. So I think the 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 term they came up with, I think is really meaningful. So so rich. Not, not only you're rich, whether tangible or whatever, but there is also a soul. And that connects to the part about giving. Lo. Giving. I, I think a great example that best represents so rich man is you. Lo. I mean, I read your story, you also go through very difficult times. I think you're really uh how should I say a, a great example of a so rich woman. And and I, I, I suppose all your students, your followers. Uh, they are really blessed uh, to to hear a story and then you know uh, walk the journey together with you. Yeah. Wow. So so Thank you're you. a great example of a story, Shuman. <laughs> Thank you for that. And also, we you know so rich woman. You talk about the F word being fabulous, having freedom, financial yeah. independence, and family. Which one is your favorite F word and why? Uh, Don't I, tell I, me I, food. Ah, uh. you have to choose between the four F. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I I think it's family lah. Yeah, mm-hmm. at, at, at the end of the day, I can imagine if I, um, how should I say, uh, I got this thing, I don't know whether it's a good thing. I always imagine if one day I'm at the funeral, right? Yeah, the, the person who, who felt the saddest, I think, is my family. Right? 
Yeah, I, I yeah I, I think so. So 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 from, from there we have a gauge right? what what truly matters to us. Mm. So so of all I think is family. I mean when when a home base uh, when a home turf family is all in place uh, like you go back home there's harmony everybody happy right. Then it's easier for us to go outside and do things. Uh. Yeah, if, if the going back to the if our soul is not happy, uh, we cannot go out and tell people about happiness. Uh. It, it's very difficult. So family, uh, family. Okay, very good. And also, how can our audience reach you? Uh, reach me. Uh. They, they, they got the link over there that you're going to send. Okay, I, I mean, they can go to Facebook and then uh, a Facebook, uh, Kaden Chang. Uh. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, I'll place all these in the show notes. Uh, you know, you can connect with Kaden the links, uh, yeah, really. in and Facebook. Uh, he's very, very active. And of course, sure. I mean, above all that you have done, I mean, all these things like value investing, you talk about, you know, building a sustainable dream, having an awesome family. What would you go stun one, you know, go stun to the number of years before and tell your younger self? Uh, my oh, so so in other words, if I can travel back in time, what would I say to my younger self? Mm. Um, I I, it, like Back to the Future, the movie. If I could, if I could travel back in time to my younger self, right, I would tell my younger self to marry the wife uh, that I married today. <laughs> yeah, but I I I think um, you see, in life sometimes we screw up like, We we make a lot of mistakes. Yeah, so so I guess to move forward, uh, we are never perfect in our decision. So we want to make less wrong and more right. So I also screw up many times. I think one of the best decisions I ever make is is to know my current wife right now. Yeah, but of course in the early days I won't know we'll get married and so on. Uh, I I think she has been the the best thing they ever have. Uh. And, and and it's not just her, you know. I, I mean when we marry someone, we marry come as a bundle, like you buy one, get many free, right? Is <laughs> I marry my wife, then got got two girls come, so the two like by free beer, right? so you buy one get many free, and then the and then there's some things you cannot choose. Eh? It's like you we can choose the wife, but the family is quite difficult to choose. If the family is positive, then hang on. So I'm quite lucky that like, if I marry a wife, then she's very positive, and she's positive because the family I'm bringing also very positive. Man. Yeah, and because of that, my when my girls are being taken care of by the family, they're all very positive there. Eh? So I was thinking, wow, this is something that. A, how should I say? It's it's like it's being sent to me, you know. Yeah. So so, so if I could travel back in time, uh, back to your question, right? Is I'll, I'll still choose the same lady, lo. Yeah. My, wow. my, my wife, my, my wife, not watching this, uh. <laughs> So she won't know. She won't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. So what is the one last advice you give to someone sitting on the fence right now, looking at I want to invest. Or maybe you have some bad experience before. What would you uh, tell them? I, I think the past uh, is never equals to the future. La. But if you do nothing, uh, your past will be equals to the future. So the only way to create a new future is to do something new. Ma. Yeah, but in order for you to do something new, uh, you, you, you need to make an effort. La. You need to make an effort. Yeah. So not all not all things are bad. Yeah. But the only way for you to find out, like what uh, Janisha was saying, the only way to, for you to find out is to do it. La. Yeah, is to do it. So the key thing is to do it. Uh, is to take action. Is to do it. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a title of the book, Richard, um, written by Richard Branson. It says, "Screw it, let's do it." This is one of my favorite phrases. So that would be my advice. Screw it, let's do it. Yes, and of course, for those of you who are interested to attend Value Investing Program, uh, through this link, you know, you will accept. You also get a freebie from Soul Rich Woman as well, uh, via-singapore.com forward slash free webinar. This is the main link. But if you sign up today and check out this program, uh, we will give you a freebie. All you need to do is to screenshot and then send it to us over email. And then we will also give you that freebie that comes along with this uh, episode. Wow, thank you very much, Caden, for <laughs> joining us on today's interview. And for those of you watching this, uh, do check out our podcast at soulwhy.com or the, uh, soulrichwomanpodcast.com. Okay, all available on the website. And do check out all the episodes with Gary Vaynerchuk, Neil Patel, Cheryl Sandberg, Mary Buffett. So many big names we have interviewed over the last few years and definitely will bless you greatly in your years. <laughs> In between the two years. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Take care, people. 
Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so honoured that we are connected and I hope that I can continue to serve you as you build your dreams. And if you love this episode, and I hope that you did, rate it 5 stars. Give us that glowing review because it will help more women around the world finding the Soul Rich Woman podcast. Alone you are strong, together we are unstoppable. Now share this with every woman who needs it because this is how we are changing the world, one woman at a time. As always, get out of your comfort zone and go towards the dreams you've always wanted to achieve. For women who love the F word, being fabulous, having freedom and financial independence. My dear soul rich woman, sending you my love and I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now.